yeah, here's the building. Uh, some of you may have uh, seen it before. As, um, as Marcel said, I have my, my office there. We are a team of uh, between 15 and 20 uh, architects uh, housed on the third floor of the coffee factory, which is the, the, the middle one. Um, well, you, you guys are dealing with the redesign of uh, iconic buildings and the building that you see here, as Marcel uh, already told you, is, is uh, not only a listed building, but it is even inscribed on the uh, UNESCO list of world heritage, which is quite exceptional for a 20th century buildings, um, first 20th century building. But I guess uh, whether it is uh, listed or not, I think if you have to redesign a building, uh, one way or another, you have to establish which are the values that you want to address. You know, what kind of characteristics um, you would like to keep and what kind of properties you think you should cherish or, or um, involve in your new design. So I have um, uh, some slides also to discuss that topic on how to arrive on uh, the assessment of values and characteristics that you may need to preserve or redesign or reinstall or reinvent or whatever. Um, so let's have a look at the building uh, when it was more or less completed. This is 1931, uh, except for the color, you may, be, you may agree with me that the building hasn't seen so many changes, at least not from the outside. And that uh, of course has been one of the tricks of our design to try to modernize the building in such a way and to adapt it for a new functional use without really changing the outside appearance. Now, I'm not saying that you're not allowed to change the outside appearance of a building. Sometimes it's even a very good idea to change the appearance of a building from the outside. For instance, if the building is no longer appreciated or when it doesn't have the right expression, let's say, for instance, if you would make apartments residential apartments in, inside this building, you would perhaps like to see balconies or changes to the building to express also that today it is a residential building. But in this case, because we knew it was to be nominated for UNESCO, and we also understood that we had to be very careful to make the changes to the outside and even also to the inside. So um, in order to redesign a building, you have to understand the original brief. And here you see to the left the, the client of the factory, Mr. Case van der Leeuw, and to the right his architect, Leen van der Vlucht. And uh, later on in 1932, they uh, described the brief for the factory as follows, um, that the appearance of the factory must be the consequence of the requirements for the interior. So the building was designed from the inside towards the outside. So the inside conditions were of primary importance. The design must respond to human demands as much as to mechanical ones. So the factory owner thought it was very important that people would feel well inside the building so that they could produce well. And he thought that was just as important as the requirements of the machines and all the, the internal logistics and transportation. So it had to be a very uh, human and pleasant environment. And finally, he even considered additional costs for finishes to be responsible even without a direct return on investment. So he was ready to put his money in extra quality without really getting a, a direct return um, uh, in financial terms. So that was quite uh, forward looking. If we look back at the, what it became, um, and what they didn't say at that time, but what they actually made is a vertical factory that is a factory where the products are brought to the top floor and then go through the process of refinery, uh, refinement and so on by gravity. So it's, it goes down and down step by step. It was also a daylight factory, which meant that uh, the operations had to be performed in daylight. Um, the working conditions, as I said, were very important because they understood if the working conditions were good, people would produce more. So it went hand in hand with uh, profit and economy. And um, they were looking for adaptable and generic space. And that is not a surprise because a factory, you know, it is uh, the factory processes are changing from day to day. Whenever there's a larger demand for a certain product, you know, that part of the factory operations will be extended, more machines will be bought and so on. And maybe a few months later, the demand uh, is changing again. So the building was really built to uh, to 
to be adapted constantly um, to changing operations and therefore uh, they created a building with generic space. And also because of that, they uh, wanted an extendable structure. Uh, when the company would grow, they would, um, they would have more space to extend the buildings. And this all resulted in a master plan that you see here. There were various stages in the development, but this is uh, by the end of 1926, more or less what they went for. And uh, this is actually also what more or less what you see uh, today. This is a, a picture uh, of the 1960s. Um, but you can see um, to the left the curved office block, then to, uh, in the middle the high tobacco factory, the middle uh, coffee factory, and to the right the uh, tea factory with additional buildings around it, and the soccer fields and tennis courts in the back, that was the area where the building was supposed to be extended later on. This never happened, but at least they took it into account. Now, uh, as I said, it was a daylight factory, and you can see from this picture that the building was very shallow. It was only 19 meters deep, and that meant that uh, daylight could, in, could come in from both sides. Uh, so to, as to avoid uh, shadow on your work platforms or on your work table, so there was light from two sides. And you can also see um, the very particular uh, load-bearing structure. It's uh, the columns have a uh, a head in the shape of a, a, a sort of a mushroom. And uh, due to this uh, um, constructional uh, innovation, the floor slabs could be completely flat, completely flush. So the, the ceiling slab that is, which normally have beams and beams that would block the daylight. In this case, they avoided the beams and they uh, used a type of floor system that was completely flush. And that was one of the many innovations in this building. And that is also one of the reasons why it was uh, accepted uh, by UNESCO for the World Heritage List. Now let's move on. So the, um, the, the conditions inside were considered very important. So we talked about the daylight, but also in terms of hygiene. You have to imagine that in those days, people didn't have a, a, a bathroom in their houses. They didn't have a shower. So the factory provided showers and wash basins and so on for the workers in order to, to clean themselves uh, before or after work. And all these materials were, uh, all these elements were totally new in factory design. Many of them were imported from the United States where they were a bit more advanced uh, as compared to European industrial buildings. But not only that, they, only, they also provided a garden um, as I said, the sports fields, this is the, the, the boys of the workers that are playing soccer, but also all kind of uh, um, uh, recreational activities, uh, music uh, uh, and so on were organized by the factory. That was all part of their idea. So you see that it is more than a workplace. It was actually a community. And that is also one of the characteristics I think are, is very important in this case. So. Here you see the floor plans. As you can see, the building is very shallow, as I told you. And uh, as a result, it features these enormous glass fronts over the full uh, length of the building. I think the building is about 400 meters long um, or even more. And that glass facade was also a, a kind of a advertising sign for the company, you know, saying like, look how modern we are. We are transparent and, uh, you know, it's all glazing. And so it was a, also a characteristic that was not only functional, but that also had a sort of an architectural meaning. And I think that is also a characteristic that we should understand when redesigning it. So here you see a few of the innovations. Uh, to the left, the, the section with the mushroom columns, as I explained, and you can see how the floor slabs actually project slightly outward. So the columns are not in line of the facade, but they're moved a little bit inward. And in doing so, of course, the static moments in the concrete floors were much more uh, efficient. So uh, there was a saving of, of, uh, of concrete and materials uh, by constructing it like that. And the other advantage was that the, the facade could actually run in front of the whole construction like a curtain, hence the name curtain wall. So it's a self-supportive um, uh, facade construction that left the, um, the load bearing structure completely separate. So in the middle, you can see how, they, how these elements were prefabricated into, in, a, in a workshop. This was another innovation. 
So the building was not, the facade was not built up on site, but it was prefabricated in an industrial way. And those uh, elements were brought to the site and then put up. And to the right, you can see uh, where I put the red arrow, how they, uh, the, the concrete uh, work featured rails, metal rails, and they, those were necessary as anchors to anchor the metal uh, panels of the facade to the structure. Now, that is quite an innovative thing as well, because in those days, they didn't have power drills. The, the Bosch power drill was only developed a few years after this building was constructed. So the architects decided to use concrete because it was fireproof and hygienic, but it was impossible to, to attach anything to it. And that, of course, was a problem because the, the, the machines had to be moved and the conveyor belts have to be moved once in a while to change the production processes. So how do you manage that if you cannot attach anything to the concrete frame? Now, the building is full of those metal rails. And in these metal rails, you can, you can put a bolt and fix something. And then you can also um, uh, loosen it later on and re remove the element and put it somewhere else. Of course, not a facade, but for instance, conveyor belts in that way could be changed the roots of conveyor belt could be changed inside the factory. So um, that was all quite innovative. Now, here you see the results. Those guys at the bottom are really astounded. Just imagine when you worked in a dark and ugly, uh, dusty factory before, and then your first work day in the new factory here, that was quite a novelty. So people were enthusiastic about it. Here you see the factory from the back. And uh, the coffee factory in the middle, you see those skylights, they caught the northern light. This is this space, and that is because on the top floor of the coffee factory, they had to look at the quality of the coffee beans. And they needed the daylight uh, to do that, to see if the, the beans were dark or if there was any damage to the beans. So that, produced, that uh, created quite a special uh, space on the top floor. Um, on the, uh, in the middle section of the coffee factory, there's a double high space, which was the former toasting department, where the coffee or, or roasting department, I should say, where the coffee was roasted. They needed the double high space to put the big machines in there. And then on the lower floors, we see the bridges bringing all the products to the storage house uh, across where the trucks could come and pick up the products and bring it to the, to the shops, to the stores. Now, when you decide that this building is a heritage building, and if you own the building, then you say, heritage, now what? What the hell am I going to do with this building? What is still allowed? What is not allowed? Or what should we do? Now, well, a first step um, to, um, to understand that is to, as I said, to uh, assess the values. Now, one method, this is another building, this is the mass silo in, in the harbor of Rotterdam, but one way to look at, at value is to, to try to figure out the age. You know, most of these buildings and complexes are not built in one go, but they are built uh, consequently in stages. So you may determine, you know, what was the oldest stage and what was a more recent stage, and you may attach value to that. Uh, so it's a timeline, as you see at the bottom. This is student's work, of course, uh, where they use the timeline as a, as a, a way of uh, assessing the value. But that's not all. But it helps. Here you see the vanilla factory um, uh, assessed in that way. The green parts uh, were valued very high at that time because they were the oldest ones. Well, the, the yellow ones are uh, in between and the orange or red ones were later. So here you see an example where the age value of a building has been made most important. But this is 20 years ago. And nowadays we look at things differently. And we look at the buildings very carefully. But uh, you may tell these are two uh, more or less the same sections where you see to the left in the section that the floor still had beams, whereas to the right, you already see how that model changed into the mushroom shaped columns. So whenever you go to archives and so on to figure out, you know, what is uh, what has been the design idea of a building and how it was made, you may be very happy with finding uh, the, the drawing on the left, which is an original blueprint until you suddenly realize that the, the drawing is not correct. It was, the building was not built like that. So, you know, you have to be very careful to, to go to archives, pick drawings and just say, I found it. And now this is how we're going to do it because they may be false. Um, so you have to look at the building itself. And this is uh, one of the mapping systems that uh, uh, those professionals use. 
the red colors are mostly elements that are still original uh, and date to the first phase of the construction. Um, the, the yellow ones are again in between and the green ones are more recent and may be changed more easily. Um, now this is about the building materials and the building parts and so on. And another type of, of research, so this is historic building survey, another type of research is looking at the materials and the colors. You see the same plan by another expert who is a specialist in colors. And they figured out how the original flooring and the linoleums, you see the purple parts in the middle, you see the, the picture on the, to the right, where you see two colors of linoleum, a darker one along the perimeter and a lighter one in the middle. That is exactly what is indicated on the drawing below. So that is another type of expertise that may be important to, uh, to, uh, to assess the values. Now, uh, one, of, uh, one of the important uh, theories comes from uh, Alois Riegel, the uh, Austrian, uh, I think he's Austrian or German, I, I'm not sure. Austrian, yes. Oh God, not yes. Austrian. Yes. Austrian, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he was the first guy who started to, to define, you know, what, what kind of values you could actually uh, uh, look at. So there's historic value, artistic value, age value, I already mentioned that commemorative value, use value, and New Year's value. Now, if you're interested in that, you can read his book, dated 1903. Um, so he was a sort of a, a founder of, of, let's say, modern thinking of how, how to deal with heritage. But nowadays, here you see a similar chart from Professor Pereira Roders, who is in our faculty. You, know, you see a, a whole range of values, which are also social, ecological, political, Aestheticals was mentioned by, uh, by Riegel as well. So what you see here is that uh, the increasing value that is attached to not to tangible things, but also to intangible things. So the meaning that things have. So it's not necessarily the physical stuff or the material, but the story that the material or the, the component has to tell. So intangible values are increasingly important. Now, okay. Let's keep that in mind. But then again, look at the building. You know, you can, you can talk, you know, what kind of values are we talking about? Are we talking about the facade? Are we talking about the building as a whole? Uh, you know, so this is a, 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 another uh, way of looking at the building, the shearing layers of uh, Stuart Brandt, um, looking at the various layers that the building uh, has been composed of. And each of these layers, you can then again value according to the uh, criteria by Regal or, or uh, Roders. Now, if you put the two together, you get this. Um, so to the left is the, the, the things of Brandt, and we uh, added a few, that is the pluses. And uh, on the other axis is Regal, and also there we added a few like rarity value and, and so on. So um, by all the S's at the left, you see that we added spirit of place, which is of course intangible. That is not something you can, you can hold in your hands. Um, and also surroundings and settings. So more um, uh, intangible factors. And these type of assessment tools we use in heritage to assess which values are we actually talking about. Now, an example uh, of a student, this is a quarantine station in Rotterdam, very topical, a quarantine station nowadays. Uh, and here you see how the student actually used that chart to define certain values with images and text in order to understand what is really valuable uh, to his or her mind and what is not. So that helps you to define what kind of values you would like to preserve, either by conservation of the original building, either, like in your case, by designing something new instead of it. So when we had to think of a new use, uh, which is uh, more than 20 years ago already, uh, we had to figure out how to use a building that was designed for physical labor into a building that was to be used for intellectual labor, desktop labor. And the spaces inside the factory, uh, which were um, uh, only moderately heated, because the people performed physical labor and the machines irradiated a lot of heat, had to be transformed into spaces that we could use for designers because the factory was to be a, a hub for the creative industry of Rotterdam to house all kinds of uh, ateliers and workshops for a design company. 
So the challenge was in a space like this, how are you going to, going to manipulate that and change that into a space that could be used for intellectual work? Uh, first uh, issue, of course, was the facade. As I said, the facade was very important in the expression of the factory and the radiating the modernity of the vanilla company, but it was also single glazed. Even the metal panel on the bottom was not insulated. The, roof, the windows did not close very well anymore. So there was a lot of draft. It was really cold uh, and the rain uh, could enter and so on. So the, the primary question was, how are we going to resolve it? Now, one way is uh, to look at the facade itself. The, the facade is like a skin. Right? It, 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 it vaporizes, it breathes, but it also express, expresses things like, like we do with our face, a building. Right? So not, uh, no, no coincidence that a facade of a building is actually called facade because it's the same word as your face. So la facciata in Italian. Um, so you can try to change that skin, um, but you easily understand if you're going to tamper with the skin, for instance, the glazing, if you put in double glass, uh, then the steelwork of the windows is no longer strong enough to hold eh, because double glass is double heavy. So the original windows cannot carry the load. So you have to change the window frames as well and so on and so forth. So before you know it, we tested it at the sanatorium of 1928 in, in Hilversum, where we did exactly what I just explained, but we figured out it was incredibly complicated, very expensive, not very practical and so on. So we decided that would probably not be the best way to look at the factory. Now, another way, of course, just like a human being is to put on uh, a garment. So you'd add a secondary skin, as it were, uh, on the outside. And uh, well, as you may see from the pictures below, you know, uh, it is maybe very comfortable and very, very efficient and modern, but you lose the, the vision of the skin. So the skin is no longer visible. So the question is whether this strategy is actually suitable for a heritage building. Um, it's up to you to decide, um, but I guess uh, an image like this already explains a little bit uh, um, my, my hesitation about this. Uh, so uh, those, those were the two strategies available and neither of them was very suitable, we considered. So what then? And also because the factory was already due to be nominated for UNESCO, we knew we had to be very, very careful with making the changes. So we came up with another concept. What about putting a secondary skin on the inside? Now that is not something you can do with a human being. So we had to be really uh, innovative in order to, to understand what we could do. Um, and this, these are the early sketches. Um, so you can see how we, uh, to put a, double, a new facade on the inside of the building, creating a sort of a cavity construction, a climate wall to control um, the, the, the in interior climate of the building. And to the left where I put the orange arrows, we made that sector so wide that we could use it double as a corridor. Now, that worked quite well. Here you see an image again with the arrow, the orange arrow uh, where the corridor is. Um, and we tested that on site. Here you see uh, how we could test the double reflections and what kind of a color we need to use for the frames of that secondary glazing in order to make it uh, uh, less visible from the outside. Of course, this was requirements from the heritage authorities. And in the end, you see how we, at, let's say at the sunny side, we created a climate wall. In the winter, the sun heats up the in-between air before it is entered into the offices. And in the summer, uh, we operate the windows automatically to have the uh, hot air escape the building. Here you see the other side where we created the corridor. And so to the left or to the right is the new aluminum facade with the doors um, of the new offices, which has the double glass. Here you see the result from the outside. Inside, you see the new aluminum uh, windows. So um, the, the secondary skin on the inside appeared to be working quite well for the factory, but of course you have to take into account that you lose a lot of floor area that you cannot rent out. So it is a, a, a bit of a, a, a trick that you have to discuss with your client if it is okay to do that. And that is the reason why we um, enlarged the cavity, uh, the last one that you saw uh, into a corridor because you need a corridor anyway. So uh, we used one of the cavities as a corridor to make it more efficient. So, 
Marcel, I'm uh, I'm a bit uh, longer than anticipated. I hope you don't mind. I'm I'm on two thirds now. No problem. We are enjoying this. Yeah. So that is uh, you've seen the first sketch. So we you know the next step is to make a bit more precise drawing and to figure out whether you could uh, organize all this. So the red arrows uh, um, you see were the initial idea. You know whether we could. Uh, draw in the air from outside uh, through the cavity uh, to enter the offices. And in order to do that, you need an under pressure in the inside space. So the green arrows indicate that we had to exhaust air from the central part where the offices were in order to create an under pressure so that the fresh air, the red arrows, um, uh, would, would, would be uh, drawn into the, the space uh, in a natural way, preheated, as I explained in the winter. So the question then was, how are we going to make these exhausts? I already explained how one of the characteristics of the building was that it had flush floor slabs with mushroom columns and no beams. So the, 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 one of the design ideas was to have flush ceilings, to have the daylight entering and so on. So we didn't want any ventilation ducts to be uh, fixed to the ceilings because they would have disturbed the, the flush ceilings and they would have taken away the views on the mushroom columns. So then the question is, here's the green arrows again on top of the uh, image, you know, we need exhausts over there, but we don't want to see them. So how are we going to do that? Well, here you see again a next stage where the green arrows show how we propose to have the exhaust ducts not under the floors, but on top of the floors, in the floor topping of the offices on the floor above us. And uh, so this allowed us to leave the ceilings um, flush without any ducts. The ducts were put in the flooring and there's a collector duct, as you see to the right, the green uh, rectangle uh, where all the exhaust air is collected. Uh, this creates an under pressure in the offices, so the, the blue line indicates the fresh air from outside that is drawn in, then led into a, uh, um, a ventilator convector to be heated in the winter, which is the red arrow, and that, that air then enters the space. So that is quite a, a story. Now the problem only was that the original flooring was also original. It was still there, and it was of a colored cement, uh, uh, which was uh, very typical for the period. So in order, this was a decision we had to make, are we going to retain the original material of the flooring or are we going to retain the original design ID of the flush ceilings, the mushroom columns and the daylight qualities? And uh, this was discussed with the heritage authorities and we decided in the end to sacrifice the material and to go for to retain the architectural ID of the building. So this is an, an example of, of where the material is regarded less important than the architectural concept. And to the right, you see how the workers are putting those uh, ventilation ducts and hot and cold water uh, tubes and, and data and electricity on top of the uh, um, construction floor of concrete. And then on the lower picture, you see how the floor finish, it's about 10 centimeters is again, put on top of it to hide all the ducts. So, um, well, that is a part of the story. Of course, the, the windows had to be, uh, is for the summer situation, the windows had to be operated um, to have the hot air escape. On the top red circle, you see the original operation handles. Uh, of course, due to the secondary skin, you could no longer reach them. You could not enter. Um, so they had to be automated. So we uh, prolonged the, the access and put a little motor at the bottom uh, that is operated by a computer. And as soon as the temperature is rising too high, uh, the windows open automatically and uh, the hot air can escape in order to prevent the hot air to enter the offices. So again, the original, and this is how the uh, workspaces look nowadays. To the right, you see the double skin climate wall. Of course, there was a lot of restoration work as well. I'm not going to elaborate a lot on that, but for instance, for the original uh, toilets and so on, we had these special parts remade in a ceramics factory. They are all made by hand, very expensive. And that is also, also a part, of course, of a conservation project, but I'm not going to elaborate. A thing that I would like to discuss is the idea of community that is also intangible. 
originally, as I explained, the workers of the factory and their families formed a sort of a community. If you had a job with Fanella, that was very important. Your kids could go to the sports club. There was all kind of education and entertainment that was organized. And um, that was also necessary because the uh, building was very remote. It was not in the city, but it was quite far away. And um, when we uh, redesigned the Vanilla Factory for a hub for the uh, creative industry of Rotterdam, of course, we ran into the same problem. There were no stores around the corner. There was no childcare center. Um, there was not even a restaurant and so on. So we had to think about things, you know, to recreate this self-sufficient enclave into something that would work for modern times. And um, therefore, we decided to look at the, the toasting department that you see again to the left during the works. And we created a, a, a shared restaurant and, and coffee outlet where people could pick up their mail, meet other uh, uh, um, colleagues from other companies. For instance, we had our website designed by a website designer who was also a tenant in the factory. And we met him you know, during lunch at the restaurant. And uh, so that is how we try to make that into a community and the lunch table to the left in the evening could be turned into a catwalk for one of the other companies that designed uh, fashion and could invite her, uh, her um, business uh, associates and, and clients to come to the show. Meeting rooms of all sorts we could provide there and so on. So that is why we use the building now in, uh, in that way. Here you see the result. So the double high space in the middle where you see the high windows uh, without a, a parapet, that is exactly the area that I just showed where we have the restaurant. For some results in the back, original, still single glass. And after our intervention, when we added the secondary skin on the inside, as I mentioned. So we left large areas of the building uh, almost unchanged. Uh, so this still has single glass and that is used for all kinds of events like concerts and shows and uh, seminars and, uh, well, you name it, everything is possible there. So to come slowly to a conclusion, um, what were our design dilemmas? As I said, um, you know, you start with cultural values, but in the case of Vanella, we realize that cultural values are also social values. So it's not uh, cultural values can be, I don't know, an ancient church with a beautiful altarpiece, you know, that is obvious, that is a cultural value. It's an artifact. But the social values are much different. That is what is the, the story around the altarpiece, or in this case, the story around the, the factory. And in the case of Vanella, even it's environmental because it was also uh, a self-sufficient enclave. There was a collective uh, group of people uh, socially attached to this place. Uh, and I ex explained how the working conditions were important. So the, the, the value of this place were much more versatile and rich as compared to, uh, let's say, uh, an, an ordinary um, listed building or uh, a cultural artifact. Now, another thing was that um, I explained that the building had to respond to short-lived functional programs because of the changes in fabrication processes. And the architects responded to that by creating a generic building. All the spaces are almost the same. They are, have the same height, the same width, the same columns, the same light. So you could actually do everything everywhere. So it's in a way a generic building. At the same time, now that it has a heritage status because of all the, the sublime innovative uh, characteristics it has, it is suddenly unique and iconic. So how can something be generic? and at the same time be unique. So that is a sort of a conflict of ideas that you have to get to grips with conceptually. This is more physical. The first one is more in line with the, the previous ones. You know, if, if a monument, let's say, is solid, it's permanent, it's there forever, we want to keep it for future generations. At the same time, we see the function is changing. It's no longer a factory. Now it is a, a creative studio space. Maybe in two years, 20 years time, it will again be something different. So it's this, this dilemma of the permanence versus the adaptability. Now, when it comes to physical things, the iconic facades are two thirds of glass and all of that was non-insulated. Now that of course was a huge dilemma 
to bring that to terms with the thermal performance that we needed for a sort of office space that was required. And uh, to come even to more uh, concrete uh, issues, um, we were struggling with a, a sustainable climate control and energy management system. Now, why is that? Of course, we put in the double skin, which means that actually the building has triple glazing now. One layer of glass in the original facade and then a double layer of glass in the additional facade that we put in. But the energy management was still a sort of an issue. Um, this building was not redesigned for one client who could say in advance what she wanted in terms of uh, climate control quality. My client wanted to offer tenant, tenants uh, a variety of options. So let's say a cheap office with only a, a heating radiators or a more expensive office with heating radiators and cooling uh, ventilator convectors. Um, in order to uh, be to have spaces available for a variety of rents. Now, then, if you look at the energy management, that presented the problem because we wanted to make an aquifer storage system and store the heat uh, in the summer into the groundwater and then pump it up again in the winter. But in order to do that, you have to be you have to have a balance of the energy that you put into the groundwater in the summer and the amount of heat that you take out again in the summer. It has to be roughly the same amount. And because we could not predict in advance how many tenants would choose the more uh, luxurious uh, climate control systems with the cooling machines, we could no, not predict in advance whether the aquifer storage would work. And that is the reason why at one point my client had to make a decision whether to make it or not. And it was decided not to make it. Of course, in retrospect, we regret it because most of the tenants, they choose for the cooling machines as well. And in the end, we could have made it, but we didn't because we didn't know in advance. So that is again, you know, the, the permanence versus the adaptability, you know, for, for the use, you want to be volatile, you want to make changes, you want to be adaptable. But at one point, you know, if you build a building or construct it, you know, some decisions have to be made, but what you make solid and permanent and will stay there for a number of years as was indicated in the initial drawing by Stuart Brandt, you know, the various ages of, of uh, the load bearing frame, the, 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 the facade and so on, they all have different lifespans, of course. Now, that is about uh, my story. Um, so in, in the end, after the works, we were able to propose it for UNESCO. It was accepted, which was quite a rarity because the building underwent quite some changes. So we were very proud that UNESCO still found it acceptable uh, despite our interventions as an architect. Now, if you would like to read more about uh, Designing from Heritage, there's this booklet. It's uh, downloadable for free from the, uh, the website. Uh, so you can have a look at it. And that uh, was my story, uh, Marcel.